The pleasure. So uh, the meeting is being recorded. That's great. Um, so thanks very much for the invitation. Let me just start by sharing my screen. Uh, I'm going to use slides. So let me get them in place. Uh, and so I hope you can all see uh, the slides. So um, you guys are probably more familiar with the format than me, but I can tell you what my interpretation was, to, was that I wanted to show you a little bit about my uh, path into and through physics as a person, uh, why I made the choices I did, uh, and also how I really like the science evolved in parallel with that. Uh, so I've titled the talk, uh, Humiliated by a Single Atom, uh, An Accidental Enjoyment which sort of reflects the fact that when you try and control even the simplest things that you can think about, it turns out to be way more complicated than you think and every new thing you do doesn't work. Yeah, so that's sort of the where I've ended up. Uh, but of course, where I started was as a child uh, doing things nothing to do with uh, single atoms. And so I wanted to sketch to you a little bit my path through from uh, being a child who wasn't interested in individual atoms at all, but in ships and uh, violin, uh, through to uh, doing quantum physics, if you like. So um, indeed, where did it all uh, start? Why did I start in uh, quantum physics at all? Uh, so actually, I think there may be a little bit of a mix of enjoying maths and also being a bit lazy. Maths came reasonably easily, probably because I enjoyed it and liked practicing it. Uh, but somehow I didn't see the need for doing lots of proofs of things. So in mathematics, you know, you have to prove things beyond any sort of normal uh, need that I have in the world uh, to show myself how things work. Uh, and somehow that was reflected a little bit in my teens in reading uh, this book from uh, Richard Feynman. Surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman, which uh, sort of uh, painted a very nice picture of a playful physicist who really played with mathematics, enjoyed mathematics, uh, and... Uh, at the same time, sort of wanted to humiliate his mathematical colleagues, right, and um, uh, enjoyed the sort of practicality of the, the physics part of that, yeah. So somehow with that in mind, then uh, I went towards uh, studying. Uh, the system in England is a little bit different to how it goes in the US. So I, at age 18, was still in what you would call grade school, I guess, and um, then went to university, but at university we just study physics, right? So all I ever did was physics at university. There was no more uh, breadth than that. So what did I do in my physics? Uh, as I said, I was somehow mathematically focused, right? So uh, in my first year, I made sure to uh, take theory type courses. And I think the thing I spent most time doing was uh, contour integrals and complex numbers, which I just thought was really cool mathematics at some level. And somehow the physics didn't connect with me quite yet, I think because I found it really hard. Yeah, uh, I'm not somebody who ever had really an intuition for doing physics, Yeah, but rather I always somehow gained the intuition from doing it mathematically uh, initially. Yeah, uh, And that was reflected in, I think, the fact that when quantum physics came along, it didn't require some prior intuition, but I could build it from the mathematics. And somehow that was very appealing to me. Also, the math is very sort of clean in, in quantum physics. And then there were a couple of things my tutor threw out to me that the, the real way to do quantum mechanics was to read Dirac's book. I don't know how many of you have read Dirac's book, but it's this funny thing where uh, it's a long book on quantum mechanics, very serious maths, but it's almost all about uh, classical physics. Yeah, So he does this really beautiful construct of classical physics and then turns it into quantum mechanics at the end. So then uh, in my fourth year, I guess I was going through and you see, I, I still took some element of theoretical physics. Uh, and that was where I started with my projects, right? So the in the final year in Oxford, you take a project. And I took a theory project, actually wanting to do something about waves, but the title got changed into uh, sort of structures in the inner crust of neutron stars. And this didn't really work for me. Uh, it was a group that was basically me plus one retiring professor. I found the topic to be unmeasurable. I can't, I still don't know to this day how anyone measures whether we got right, what the structures on the inner crust of a neutron star were. And there was somehow no social interaction. Now that was my perception then. There were probably interesting aspects of this problem, but I came to the conclusion that I needed really a social aspect to my life. And so I headed in the direction of experiments to try and uh, provide that. Uh, so somehow you can see then, uh, these are the areas that I applied to for PhDs. And, and you can see that I hadn't really 
made up my mind what direction I was going into. Uh, so there's some cool things you can do by shooting, you know, three or four lasers into a very hot flame. And you can try and see from nonlinear sort of uh, interactions what the constituents are of the flames. That's one thing I applied to do. Another thing was laser acceleration of electrons and sort of wake field acceleration. I still think that's a cool area, uh, but in the end decided not to do it. And then finally was these, uh, actually two groups I applied to, to do this new sort of quantum computation, which was a fairly new experimental area. This was 2001 when I was applying. Uh, and there were two options in Oxford, one with trapped ions, which I now study to all the way today, uh, or one with photons, but the group in photons was uh, defecting off to Santa Barbara. And so somehow there was never a chance. I wanted to stay in Oxford at the time. Yeah. So uh, with that, then uh, this list, if you like, came down to partly on the recommendation of a friend who'd done a project, came down to doing uh, quantum computing uh, with trapped ions. And I'll tell you a little bit more about quantum computing in a moment. But I would say the primary focus at the time was just that I heard that the supervisor was a really uh, interesting person. Yeah. So my PhD supervisor was a guy called Andrew Steen, uh, and he was an experimentalist, actually. So his PhD was in uh, laser cooling, trying to get atoms really cold in the early days of doing uh, laser cooling. And then he, in the mid-90s, had seen sort of this new area of quantum computing coming up, so the ability to make uh, computers that functioned using quantum mechanics. Uh, and as a result, he sort of take a look at what systems he thought might be best for that and had come to sort of the idea of using, instead of neutral atoms, using charged atoms, which looked like a good uh, candidate at the time. Uh, so actually, Andrew, he, I say he, here that he's an uh, experimentalist, uh, but actually he's most famous for theory. So actually, uh, one of the things you have to do in a quantum computer is you have to tolerate the fact that whenever you do stuff to quantum objects, you make mistakes. There are lots of errors. And you can't get away with the sort of normal redundancy that you do in classical physics. And this was in the mid 90s thought to be an end game, something that would just end quantum computers in terms of building them. Uh, until uh, Andrew and independently Peter Shaw, and I think Peter Shaw's paper is slightly before Andrew's, uh, came up with this idea of being able to nevertheless uh, correct errors on quantum, on quantum hardware. Uh, and that sort of uh, opened the path to really building uh, real quantum computers that would uh, tolerate their faults, overcome their faults, uh, and give reliable answers. Yeah. So somehow this is remarkable uh, that, that this was somebody who uh, came up with really quite innovative theory, uh, despite being an experimentalist in their background. Yeah. And uh, somehow this, uh, I think his paper title here sums up a lot of my interest. Maybe I was only inspired by him, but uh, somehow this concept of which I like in quantum mechanics is the fact you've got interference going on all over the place. Uh, and the fact that you apply it to uh, sort of computational problems like error correction uh, really is a nice link between sort of information domain and, and physics domain. Yeah. So uh, then I have to tell you a bit about my experiences of my supervisor, right? So Andrew was a really nice guy, super enthusiastic guy, uh, but an extremely intense and serious thinker. Yeah, and to the extent that whatever he found interesting that week, he would go away and think about, yeah, and he would disappear and think about it in his office. You'd have to go and sort of almost hammer on the door and then bug him a bit to get him to sort of talk to you, yeah. But it was great, it was very inspiring, and uh, he didn't really let any details go, yeah. Uh, and that was sort of illustrated to me. Actually, the photo you see here is from maybe five years ago when he came to give a colloquium at DTH. And I sort of said to him, well, you know, it's about 20 years on from this great paper you wrote on error correction. Wouldn't it be nice to see what your perspectives are on error correction today? Uh, but Andy wasn't thinking about error correction anymore. He was writing books on relativity uh, and he'd found like a series of interesting problems he'd found on uh, relativity. So he instead uh, titled his uh, colloquium with the impossible electron, understanding the paradoxes of self force, which is basically I mean, my gist of it, and I'm a bit naive on this, was that if you make a sphere of charge small enough, it, according to relativity, it'll start self-accelerating, yeah, uh, which is sort of becomes unphysical, yeah. 
Now, I'm talking about a classical sphere of charge, and fortunately, it has to be smaller than you would allow it to be with quantum mechanics, right? But nevertheless, there were lots of these cool effects that he'd been spending his time tracking down. And I think that just illustrates a really interesting thinker uh, who uh, likes to pursue interesting physics. I think it's kind of a remarkable feature of this uh, person. So what did I do with Andrew? Well, I joined actually an experimental group. He was an experimentalist, and we were trying to build uh, quantum computers. Yeah. So I have to tell you a little bit about quantum computing, uh, and I'm going to not tell you about what it does necessarily, but just tell you about it from the nuts and bolts angle, because that somehow is a builder of quantum computers. That's what I do, right? So here's a diagram you might see in quantum, quantum computing literature, and let me tell you what it is. Basically, every horizontal line you see here is like a timeline, right? And it's a timeline for what I'd call a quantum bit uh, or a qubit, right? So for me, every single qubit, these bright dots you see here are each a picture that I'm, I've taken in the lab actually of an individual atom, okay? So think about the fact that I've stored information in an individual atom and there's a kind of timeline, this is going from left to right of what happens to that atom, right? So uh, what does happen uh, to the atom? Just let me say first up that the each of these atoms has an electron in uh, and like the hydrogen atom, you can think of these electrons as being orbitals, right? So they can be in a, a spherical orbital or an extended orbital or something like that. The atom can take different shapes, yeah? And I'm basically gonna take, pick two of these and slightly fictitiously call it a spin, yeah? Uh, and imagine that there's a, either a spin up or a spin down and maybe if it's up, I'll call it one. If it's down, I'll call it zero. And that's if you like a bit of information, yeah? So each of these atoms has its timeline. What needs to happen to these atoms? Well, one of two types of things we were told in the mid eighties, yeah? Either something happens to individual atoms, right? And that would be called a gate on a single qubit, right? And for us, that's basically, you take this atom here and you shine a laser on it for a certain amount of time. And then you turn the laser off. And then I did an operation, which here I called H, okay? So I'm gonna be as abstract as that. Let's just call it H, right? Now, the other more difficult thing in all these different platforms to do is this type of operation here. And you see that this line and this circle and dot and things like that, they connect this timeline to this other timeline here. So they kind of look like an interaction between the two. And indeed they are, they're a very controlled type of interaction that we would call a conditional logic gate. So it says, if the logic here is doing is one, for instance, then change the state of this one here. And if the logic here is zero, don't make any change. So it's a conditional thing. In a sort of logic gate, you might get in classical information, you, a NAND or, or an AND gate is also making comparisons of the inputs and changing what the outputs do. And this is basically what this uh, gate here is doing. So these are the sort of circuits we like to draw. Uh, and the key challenge often in any technology is to realize these uh, two qubit gates that connect two of these uh, individual systems. So uh, with that in mind, sorry, my thing stopped advancing somehow. So how do we realize this in our system, the system that I work with, okay? So we basically take a, an electric potential uh, and we put atoms into this electric potential. And the key ingredient behind what we do is that these atoms are charged. So they've had an electron removed from them. And because they're charged, they push each other, right? You know that Coulomb's law tells you that electron, uh, that charge, the charges will uh, repel each other. And that's got an important effect. It means that if I can push this atom to the right, all of the other atoms move too, right? So instantly somehow the information about me pushing this atom can arrive at another atom here. And these correlations that I can generate, in fact, what I typically do to do one of these operations here is I push with a laser on that atom and this atom here. And if I do it in the right way, I can do these conditional operations between the two atoms. Yeah? And it all just uses the fact that the Coulomb interaction uh, pushes all of these atoms to move together. So somehow what you can think about is that these ions, they can oscillate a little bit in this trap the internal states of the ions, so that's something about the electron of the atom uh, is what's storing the information, but the spring that connects the two is what allows them to talk to each other. Yeah, and that's really the physics that we're making use of in order to try and build a, a computer. So um, 
how did this work in my PhD, right? So our P my PhD was between 2002 and 2006. And really we were following, we were a young group. We were building up new experiments and we were following in the footsteps of Dave Weinland's group at NIST, uh, Rainer Blatt's group in Innsbruck, who'd done many similar sorts of experiments to what we were doing in the previ previous years actually, yeah? So you have to have a slightly unique feature. And I think the unique feature we had at the time was we just worked with a fairly low oscillation frequency of the ions. And somehow what that meant is we saw a nonlinearity that these guys wouldn't have been interested in, uh, but nevertheless is something that causes error when you try to go to very high fidelity. So it was an important effect to see. Yeah. And we explored this with two types of experiment. We did it with one type where we had single ions and we realized what are called Schrodinger's cat states. So this is where, what I've drawn here is kind of a quantum state, right? So for those of you who haven't seen a lot of quantum states, let me just describe to what you what this is. Each of these combinations is a possibility for something happening. So this possibility here is that something's got spin up, that's my atom, and that there's an alive cat, you can see it's blue eyes staring at you, right? And the possibility over here is in fact the opposite, right? That the atom has now decayed into its ground state, right? Or is in its uh, spin down state. But now you see the atom's dead because I've drawn these little crosses on its eyes, right? And in quantum mechanics, the really important thing is not just that these two possibilities exist, but you have some wave behavior and waves are always described by complex numbers or phases between the different components, right? So why do I talk about that in the context of our atoms? Well, because somehow what you can look for is how can you make something similar to a cat and you need something macroscopic. What can be macroscopic? Well, atoms can travel macroscopic distances. So somehow the degree of freedom we tried to make macroscopic was to pull these atoms as far apart as possible. Yeah, we'd over a distance which you might start to make macroscopic. You would certainly call a meter macroscopic. Uh, in fact, here we're talking hundreds of nanometers still, but still this was relatively large. So it's sort of iron on the left versus iron on the right being uh, right being dead, uh, left being uh, alive cat, yeah. So I'll say more about Schrodinger cat states a little later. I've got some nice pictures for you, but uh, the main thing in my PhD thesis was certainly uh, not so much Schrodinger cats, but rather doing these two cubic gates. And actually the physics of what you do there is exactly the same as what you do in creating. This is if you like a single ion experiment, and now you play the sort of same sort of game with two ions, and you can produce what we would call entangled uh, states of two spins. So what this now says is either the atoms are both up or they're both down, but again, they have to have this phase factor between the two. So actually on the front page of my thesis, you'd see this kind of castle structure. Uh, these peaks, this one here and this one here, tell me that the probability to find the atom both down or to find the atoms both up and you can see they're not quite a half. They should be a half according to this state, but they're not because we didn't do things right. Yeah. Uh, and the phase here is somehow in the heights of these peaks. And we go and check that in an interference experiment. So you see here a fringe from an interference experiment. And the key for us in telling that we had what entangled states, that's really a key type of state for building quantum computers, is that the amplitude of this interference experiment is above uh, this 50% mark that I've drawn in the blue lines. So that was the key result of my experiment. As I said, we weren't the first to do these two cubic gates, but we did it in a new system and we certainly found out new intricacies of experiments in doing that. So from there, I, I was encouraged to continue in quantum computing. I was still finding it very interesting, not understanding even these very simple systems. And so I was intrigued to do that a little bit more. And the, as I'd said previously, the standout group in that area was in NIST Boulder with uh, working with Dave Weinland, who, somehow since the 1970s, that's the year when I was born actually, had been a leader in doing quantum uh, control experiments, which then led into quantum computing. So I moved to Boulder, Boulder was a beautiful place. This is the Department of Commerce uh, Laboratories. So this is NIST actually, uh, formerly uh, uh, under a different name, but basically, and it sits in this beautiful site just before the mountains. So you can just walk off off the back of your work and, and uh, head off into the hills. Yeah. So there I worked with Dave, this is Dave. Dave's always wearing a North Face fleece, basically, yeah. I saw him in one picture wearing a tie, but it was basically for the Nobel Prize ceremony. That's all I can really say, yeah. So as I told you, Dave spent uh, many years leading quantum control of all types. Yeah, he's invented, I think, many things. 
But I thought yeah, I'd tell you something about his personality rather than listing all his achievements. Yeah. So uh, if you're in a talk with Dave, then very often he's the first guy who gets lost, right? Well, I think probably not. We're probably all lost, but he's the first guy who admits to getting lost, right? So he's super humble with respect to his lack of understanding of things. And I think that's something that he doesn't let himself get lost, whereas many of us will easily let ourselves get lost by the speaker. Yeah. So this was always really nice to see. He would be the first to ask a question. And usually it was like, I, I don't get this quite Yeah. sort of question. Yeah? So that sort of instigates, he, he was always worried about little details. Yeah. And he's sort of an atomic clock person. He wants to make the best clock ever. That's sort of his driving force, I think. And you see that he worries about every little detail. And of course, for an experimentalist, that's great. Yeah. And somehow linking back to my original theme that probably, uh, I say probably because uh, he wouldn't claim this for himself. The reason he's such a humble and nice person is that he's humiliated by a single atom every day, right? But maybe on a daily basis, he's humiliated a little bit less than the rest of us because he's, he's really good at what he does, right? So this was kind of the joy of working for Dave was that he always thought he was wrong, but probably he was right somehow behind the scenes. Yeah, that was uh, always fun. So what did I do with Dave Weinland? Um, so what I've described to you so far is kind of the standard approach for doing quantum computing with ions. You take a string of ions. This is actually from a string from Rainer Blatt's group. And you, you basically do optics to make sure you can shine laser beams on pairs of ions to do gates between the two ions. Yeah. But Dave was already in the 1990s thinking well beyond that, because he was thinking to himself that, well, there's 50 ions here, but how do I go to the levels that I need for a quantum computer? And I just say that people think you probably need a million qubits for a quantum computer. So there's, you really have to go to a scale that's way beyond this. Yeah? And one of the thoughts he had, uh, again, end of the 90s was, uh, well, you have to modularize the system. And in trapped ions, the thought for doing that was the fact that uh, if you have charges, then by changing the potentials in which they're trapped, you can move these charges around. And so the idea was to maybe have a chip style device where basically these atoms were above the chip and could be shuttled around uh, or in the chip, but uh, could be shuttled around above the chip in free space by changing the potentials on the electrodes. And what that would allow you to do was always keep the number of atoms you needed in any one of these zones small so that you could still do extremely uh, high fidelity operations, high quality operations, without having to deal with a many body system, which essentially is what these larger 50 ion systems are. Yeah. So this was a really nice uh, thought. It, they somehow got named the quantum CCD architecture because of all this shuffling uh, and reorganizing of the system. And I was intrigued to go and work on that with uh, Dave. And actually this is a scheduling of the sort of experiments we were doing. So uh, we had two species of ions, magnesium and beryllium. Uh, and we were doing things like we would trap them all in the same place. We would then uh, split them into two different groups. Uh, they would get hot doing that because we couldn't do it very well. So we would then do some cooling. Uh, we would then be ready to do uh, operations, quantum operations with them separated. And what this allowed us to do in, in this particular case is actually we could make these ions entangled before we split them apart. And so we were able to distribute quantum computer information. And the challenge was somehow to make sure we could distribute using these shuttling methods, these transport methods, but also keep on computing at some level. Yeah, so that was sort of the things that we wanted to show. And the key to that was that uh, in a sense, because we did use these two species, and that's something that's remained with me since, if you like, one which was used to have quantum bits in it. But the challenge of that is if you get hot, to do laser cooling on an atom, you typically have to scatter photons from the atom. And that would kill your quantum bits, right? So uh, what we did was we carried around all the time these magnesium atoms, uh, and then we could do laser cooling on the magnesium. And because these things are coupled by their Coulomb repulsion, if you cool down magnesium, then you cool down the beryllium as well, and then you're ready to do the operations. The operations somehow, because they use the motion, they always require the motion to be reasonably cold. So this was kind of the game. So what did we do? We did a few different experiments. Uh, one of the ones uh, which I took most of the time, or we were always aiming towards this thing, was to actually take two oscillators that were separated from each other and put them in an entangled state. So I think that was the first time anyone entangled oscillators. Yeah, uh, And so here you see an archetypal state. You again see this sort of sum of two terms with some correlations in each of them and a phase, right? 
And again, you see a sine wave and you see that we just made it, right? We struggled with this experiment quite a lot because we had to get this amplitude over 50% and it didn't uh, budge very easily over that value. It was a very hard experiment at the time. Yeah? Uh, so we sort of spent a long time uh, working on this. Now, uh, I think the next slide, well, yeah, let me just say a little bit more. So of course I have phrased what we were doing in terms of quantum computing, and this was kind of playing around with oscillators. It wasn't quantum computing as such but it did incorporate all these different techniques that were required for this quantum CCD. And that was somehow one of the things we were trying to do. And we then extended it more rigidly into quantum computing. And I think the same basic processes, we had a whole set of operations that we wanted to demonstrate, two cubic gates, single cubic gates, and transport all in the same apparatus along with measurement. And we wanted to demonstrate we could sort of do that repeatedly because if you want to scale up, you need to be able to do your operations uh, many, many times, many, many repetitions after reconfiguring the system. So there are a whole sequence of things we did. I won't say too much more about that, but we basically were checking if we did something once involving all these different components, uh, did it have the same performance as doing it twice in a row? Yeah, and that was kind of the game of that experiment. But a really key element there, again, same thing that I mentioned before was this use of a second species to recall the system. Uh, down to the ground state, keep it reset, essentially. Yeah. So uh, those are the experiments I did at NIST, but these were really the experiments I did at NIST, okay? So uh, NIST used pretty old school lasers. We worked always with uh, the ions we used had wavelengths in the ultraviolet. And to get them, you somehow first had to build these horrible things called dye lasers, yeah? And so what you see here, uh, you may know a laser pointer, right? That's like a nice small laser, but this is a one meter long uh, laser and that's not the worst of it, right? So what that means that one meter long laser is there's a mirror here, there's a mirror somewhere over here, which is almost a meter away and another two mirrors hidden in this box here and they all have to be super well aligned, yeah? But just to make it hard, uh, somebody made the idea of making this laser based on a high pressure jet of dye, yeah? So not only do you have to have these mirrors well aligned, but you have to have them well aligned to a squirting jet of high pressure dye that goes through here. And this dye goes bad, right? So on about a sort of six month time scale, the dye gradually gets worse and worse. And then you have to change it. And that's just the most filthy job. This stuff is bright red. It goes everywhere. It stains everything you can think of. Uh, and this was like definitely the worst job in the lab, right? So some guy came by, we had these results that made quite a bit of a media splash at the time, right? Some guy from a hobbyist called Dr. Dobbs, he came by and he was writing this cool little website and he, he phrased it really nice. The nastiest job in the lab is to clean the dye bucket. You know, just one of those sacrifices we make for science, but it really was a filthy business. I would say 90% of my time at NIST at the time, the lasers have been replaced now, but was spent tweaking up dye lasers yeah, and the associated optics. So it really wasn't doing quantum computing at all. Anyway, we survived that, right? We got some results. And um, with that, then I moved to ETH Zurich. Uh, and one thing I was just pointing out to the organizers before the session, if you like, um, was that I hadn't heard of ETH Zurich before I applied for the job. So I got invited to apply by someone who met Dave Wineland in, a, in Singapore, actually. Uh, and I, I found out about this wonderful place. And I think I'm from the English speaking world. And I think basically one of the challenges is that in the English speaking world, it gets called ETH Zurich, it gets called the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology Zurich, it gets called EPF, which is the French version uh, Zurich, uh, and you never see consistency here. So while I knew a lot of very good scientists, which it turned out were at ETH, I never put them in the same place in the world sort of thing, yeah. Uh, anyway, I arrived there and I've enjoyed it very much ever since, so uh, I would fully recommend any of you to explore that option if you uh, have it in the future, yeah. Now, I was on tenure track, so uh, within six or so years, you have to, you know, get some nice results that people appreciate enough. Uh, and so you're trying to define new directions in, in doing that. Yeah. So, but I've been playing around with these two species. And what I mentioned before was really that the second species was only really being used for cooling the system back down. Yeah. And so I guess the question we asked as I came to uh, ETH was, uh, can... Can it be that we don't just use one species to be qubits and the other species for cooling, but maybe we incorporate all of these systems as qubits and periodically use them for cooling if we want, or maybe for some measurements or some more advanced algorithms, yeah? Uh, 
So some of that is a little bit, and this is a bit of an advanced comment, sort of comparing what you do with just unitary transformations on a quantum system versus what you do if you have a slightly open system and what open system dynamics can you uh, explore. And I think the other thing that's always my guide in a certain sense to physics, I'm an experimentalist, right? And I always feel like in experiments, when new techniques come on the market, they just open up uh, new possibilities. So somehow always in, in these experiments, I always wanted to just try new technologies. I find that kind of cool. And somehow it always seems that there's a little bit of physics around the corner when you try a new technology. So somehow that's a, a philosophy for me. Good. And also another criteria was not to use any dye lasers in my lab. And so you never see any dye laser in my lab. So let me just give you an idea of how you might use these two species. This is an experiment we actually did, and I would never have got tenure for this because it came too late, right? So I'll have to tell you how more I went for tenure a bit uh, uh, later on. But basically this experiment was about using two species. So you see I listed them, beryllium and, and calcium here. And here are gates, a bit like that controlled logic operation, which connect all three. And I just put them in a box because it's a complicated series of stuff. But the basic idea here was what we wanted to do was make measurements. And we wanted to make measurements of the correlations between these two guys here. And for quantum error correction, which is sort of the way to uh, make reliable quantum computers, if you like, uh, it's all about measuring correlations. It requires measuring correlations in more than two systems. But nevertheless, this was kind of a basic way into seeing, can we do all the techniques we need for quantum error correction? Yeah? And what that is, is feeding information about correlations into an extra system that gets measured and where you perform feedback to correct your system. Yeah? And so we were doing that over many rounds and that's basically what the idea of one of the experiments that we did. We did it with, actually, I have this the wrong way around or this photo is the wrong way around for what we did, right? So we had one calcium and two beryllium, but basically the idea was there are two species of ions in the trap and actually, in these two photos, these are two photos of the same thing. So in both cases, there are three ions in the trap. But you see why we want to use the extra species. When we have one of them fluorescing in our laser beam, uh, you don't connect anything to the other species of ion because the wavelengths are completely different in the two species. Yeah? So the advantage of this is when we do detection, we can scatter lots and lots of photons. And we never disturb our qubits, which are held in the beryllium ions here. Yeah? So that was a key element of this uh, experiment. But there are actually a number of technological things, and that's somehow what I wanted to point out. Uh, there were lots of things with relation to the computer programming, make sure that the RF synthesis and things was able to act in closed loop uh, fashions and respond to measurement results to change what it was doing. Yeah. So this is how it worked out. This is just one of the correlations. Uh, we stabilized also entangled states, but here you see open loop, so we don't do any feedback. And what we're trying to do here is maintain a level of correlation between two beryllium ions. Yeah? And so what you see here is over many rounds of this measurement uh, with no feedback, you see a fairly rapid decay, because of, mainly because of our operations. Yeah? But if we apply the feedback and close the loop, you see that the uh, decay is much slower. And that's the fact that the feedback is doing correction on this system, and it's correcting the correlations when they go bad. So this was sort of a very elementary uh, demonstration, but over these really large number of measurement rounds now uh, of uh, quantum error correction techniques, which needs to be extended to do real quantum error correction to systems of uh, seven, nine, maybe 17 uh, qubits or so. Yeah. That's still in the future at some level. So uh, one of the other technological challenges, this is actually a picture from NIST to give you an idea of what the lab looks like. Here are these horrible dye lasers, but you'll see that that's not the end of the story in, in all told, right? There's lots and lots of optics extending all the way to the back where there's an, a vacuum system. And just inside that vacuum system is this tiny little ion trap where we trap the uh, atoms, yeah? So this is an entire optics laboratory to feed just a few ions. And somehow what we're looking to do is scale up the number of ions we can control but we do not want to scale all of this stuff up, yeah? So again, this is a little bit of technology, but in the last year, what we had was uh, now uh, new types of delivery of light to ions, where what you see here is one of the first chips where there's a fiber bundle, uh, which is just plugged in, actually butt coupled up to this gold structure here is actually the iron trap above which we trap our ions. And what we have inside that gold structure or underneath the gold structure, is actually guides for light. So these are these silicon nitride layers here, are like little optical fibers inside the chip, which channel the light. 
And there's a little grating here which diffracts the light up to an ion which sits 50 microns above the surface. Yeah. So in the last year that we've been able to get this to work, there were ma major challenges with getting, basically the main challenge here is getting the light onto the chip with low loss. So we get that down to a dB or so. Uh, and now what we're able to do is uh, decently high fidelity gates. This is not the best ever done, but in this size of trap, actually it's not too far off. Uh, and again, you see these interference fringes that we're using to show ourselves how good things are. But instead of my PhD thesis, which had a sort of 80% contrast, you see that you can not tell really the difference between one. And that's because the quality of the operations has improved dramatically. Yeah. So one thing to say about that, it's also very much post tenure. So these are stuff that happened in the last couple of years. So what were really the things we were doing for uh, more in the early stages? And this was a cool type sidekick project. So but the thing we saw was that uh, using uh, what I would say is dissipation, so somehow the ability to uh, connect to an environment, but in a very controlled way, we could make interesting quantum states. And let me just give you a simple, the first example we tried. So one of the things you do in trapped ions is you cool to the quantum ground state. So here's a spectrum of an atom, okay? This is the frequency at which you would just flip the spin from up to down and back and forth, yeah? But what happens is this atom moves and if there's a laser beam coming in, then the atom wobbles back and forth in the laser beam and it modulates the phase of the laser beam. And so just like in a radio system, if you modulate the frequency or you modulate the amplitude, when you modulate something like that, you get sidebands. Many of you might know Bessel functions that appear on these sidebands, yeah? So these are modulation sidebands. And one cool thing in ions, uh, the, they appear at a basically the oscillation frequency away from the center peak. And in normal laser cooling, if you tune to one of these sidebands and put the laser there, and you just allow a bit of relaxation of the internal state of the atom, you arrive in the coldest state of all. You arrive in the lowest energy state, which is the ground state of motion, uh, which is centered at a position. This is position on the bottom, which is zero, yeah? And at a momentum, which is zero. And this is a harmonic oscillator, so it's centered there. But in quantum mechanics, you must have some uncertainty in terms of these values. And so it's, a, it's the lowest uncertainty state you can think of. So uh, what we uh, spotted from a proposal from um, the 1990s actually, but fortunately nobody had actually picked up on this, was that by driving both of these sidebands simultaneously uh, and just allowing a little bit of dissipation to happen, the ground state and the system would end up in a state which now, if you look at it, is also centered at zero in position and momentum, but is stretched in momentum and is narrowed in the position. And if you want to do sensing, what you want to do is reduce the uncertainty of the thing you're using to sense, yeah? So actually these are called squeeze states and this one is uh, position squeezed and it allows you to more sensitively uh, sense whether your system is shifted away from this initial position. So one nice thing there was that somehow by cooling, just by basically a damping process that was rather cleverly set up and really quite simple with only two lasers, you ended up in a, a squeeze state, which was an interesting state from the point of view of metrology. So then we started playing with these squeeze states, right? Follow your nose, how can I measure squeeze states? How I can, what can I do with squeeze states? And in trying to measure them and trying to measure how narrow it was, how long it was, we started to make what we would call these Schrodinger cat states, yeah? which again, they're not dead and alive, but this is a, a picture again in position and momentum where the atom has basically been prepared in a, a superposition uh, of being on the left-hand side, and that's this blob here, and being on the right-hand side, and that's this blob here. And you can tell the difference between a quantum superposition, which is a wave effect, and somebody just telling you, okay, 50% of the time I'll give you something on the right, 50% of the time I'll give you something on the left, by the fact that there's a lot of activity going on when I plot this, uh, this, is, this is all a probability of having a certain position and momentum, right? And suddenly you see that uh, in addition to having those possibilities to be on left or right, I somehow start to have joint possibilities uh, to have a momentum zero and a position zero at the same time as well, yeah? And these interference fringes, they're basically a little bit like over there in the quantum domain interference fringes, can also take you to probabilities where this looks negative, right? So it's not a real probability I'm plotting here, yeah? So these are cool states. The atom is somehow known by the fact that I can see these interference fringes, the atom is known to be both on the left and the right at the same time in superposition. 
Uh, and that's these interferences are kind of an intriguing, very quantum mechanical uh, feature. Okay? So again, we were still playing around and we made some of the largest cats. So we stretched this thing very far out, uh, made extremely large cats, but actually then we fell on our faces on an error correction code out of nowhere. Yeah. So it turns out that if you hear what we had done was to make two squeeze states at two different positions. But if you make uh, three, then you get a pattern looking something like this. Yeah. And so what you'll see is that somehow here, it's almost like those interference patterns just appear everywhere, right? It's somehow a beautiful array of quantum interference. That's what I would say. Yeah. But the beautiful thing somehow for me was that the, these guys, Gottesman, Alexei Kitaev, John Preskill had come up in year 2000 uh, with a scheme to encode uh, a qubit in these uh, interference patterns uh, of an oscillator. Uh, and that actually is a very interesting sort of error correction. Usually when I told you about trying to do error correction, I would need seven individual atoms and, and lots of overhead on top of that. Here suddenly it was access to doing quantum error correction with just a single oscillator, yeah? And so actually we did that in the last year or so, uh, and I just share the results with you. So uh, the nice thing there is we can encode information in these funny patterns. Uh, and if we don't apply correction, again, this is number of cycles of error correction that we're doing. If we don't apply any, then you see these decay curves. But if we start to apply the correction, you see that we're able to lengthen the coherence time of the qubit, yeah? And actually that's already a hard thing to do in quantum error correction. So we're one of the first groups to do it. I think Rob Sholkov's group in Yale and maybe one other has done this with a different type of system. Uh, and I think probably this is the largest increase in logical coherence anyone achieved yet. Yeah. So in a certain sense, we're starting to make an impact in quantum error correction, but somehow for me, this was nice because it came as an accident. We weren't studying error correction. We were studying squeeze states. We followed our nose into Schrodinger cat states and we chanced upon error correction codes. And somehow for me, that's funny because the whole other line of my research is to do quantum error correction. But in fact, I did it through this playground of doing oscillator stuff uh, before I ever did it down the other line. So that was kind of cool. So uh, that's where I probably will finish. What did I learn so far, right? Um, I guess I've been managing a group now for 10 years, right? So um, research is always about people. That was always true when I was a PhD student. It was true when I was a postdoc. You have to trust people. Uh, you have to make, help them make the best of things. And you all have always, both of you have to keep learning, yeah? And then I just go back to my theory versus experiment thing. Uh, so, of course, as a professor, I somehow primarily do theory, right? I, I think sit in my lab of, and think about interesting things to do in the lab and do calculations for those. I also do psychology, right? Because when I go into the lab, people often tell me what they think is happening, and it's my job to find out what's somehow underlying it, what may be really happening, based a little bit on my own knowledge, but a bit on what they might not have thought of yet. And that, I would say part of that is psychology rather than uh, physics, yeah? But I should say that though I do theory, uh, the great thing about experiments is they always throw out problems and puzzles. And for me, that's kind of essential. I think I struggle if somebody asks me to make my own problems and puzzles, but the experiment's kind of a beautiful way of getting them thrown in your face every day. And you're always stuck. You know, the experiment is always cleverer than you. Uh, and somehow each problem you resolve, you come up to another one. So that's kind of the joy of it. So there are some of the people from quite some time ago, but I guess this is the community of research and it's a worldwide community and uh, that's somewhat reflected in the group and hopefully will be in the coming years. Yeah. So thanks for your attention. I hope there's lots of questions. Sorry, I didn't stop for any so far, but uh, uh, hopefully we have half an hour or so to follow up on that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Holm, for a wonderful talk. Um, and yeah, so as before, if you have any questions, uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you or you can um, type them to uh, send them to myself or Mitchell and we will ask them for you. Um, yeah, and to, uh, to start- I would stop my share now, right? Is that good? Or? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that would work uh, very well. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, since people are usually a little bit reticent to ask questions at first, we'll start off with some RSVP questions from our RSVP form. So the first question is, um, okay. uh, while ion drops allow for entanglement and interaction between any uh, qubits, how do you overcome the scaling restriction imposed by present geometries, like a, a line of atoms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So I think the, there's two things you can think about there. One is that the line of atoms uh, indeed 
So one thing that's nice about it in a sense is that the interactions are long range, so you can connect any pair of atoms in a string, but indeed you're restricted ultimately to a line in that approach, right? So the approach that I show there is um, uh, based on radio frequency electric fields. Yeah, and somehow Laplace's equation tells you that the good conditions in radio frequency fields, uh, i.e. where the oscillating field is zero, that's the place we like to work, they're all along a line, that's a rule somehow. So you can take two approaches, you can modularize things and you can go to the quantum CCD that I showed and you can say, well, okay, I can go in two dimensions and I will suck up a bit that every time I try and go in two dimensions, I get a bit of this RF motion, but I come to a new place when I do my gates, I'll be back where I don't have RF motion, right? So a key component there is these two dimensional junctions, but they've been quite hard to get to work, yeah? And the other way you can sort of be extensible is you can say, okay, well, I interact with light uh, and I get ions to emit photons and then I can mix them on a beam slitter, project ions into entangled states uh, and uh, use that, yeah. On the other hand, some people are pursuing 2D crystals, 3D crystals of ions uh, and trying to control those. I, I think that's gonna be hard to get really high fidelity operations. Uh, and finally, one way, in fact, which we uh, started to pursue in the last few years uh, is we, you know, one thing you can do is you can keep each iron at its own individual site, as long as you can make sort of, uh, so what the idea is basically lay out electrodes on a plane uh, and each iron then sits in its own null of the electro of oscillating field. But if these are close enough together, you can still do gates between the two. And with the radio frequencies, that to me looks rather hard. Uh, but what our idea then was to get rid of the radio frequencies entirely. Uh, and now what we will do is we, uh, we will use these microscopic electrodes with individual sites, but we'll just superimpose a big homogeneous magnetic field. And that realizes a type of trap called a penning trap. Uh, and the nice thing about that is somehow um, these, the, the magnetic field is homogeneous. And that's very different to the RF field is a microscopic structured uh, field. Whereas now what we have is a homogeneous field and just static electric potentials. And so we hope, we haven't loaded one of these traps yet, but what our hope is, is that we then can arbitrarily move these structures around without having to deal with this driven radio frequency motion. Uh, and that's really the approach. Uh, so we think that's a promising approach, uh, albeit that we have to get over step one. One thing I don't know, you know, people use these penning traps, but typically they're made of electrodes that are millimeter scale. And so very hot ions can get trapped. And with us, we're going to use, uh, you know, electrode structures that are tens of microns in scale and they have to be uh, trapped a few tens of microns above the plane, which we do with the RF traps, but nobody ever did that with a penning trap. So we have to see, that's research, right? Yeah. I have one question about the quantum error correction. So, mm -hmm. Um, is the quantum error correction originated from the experimental error like pulse imperfection or like system defect or like that or is it originated from more kind of fundamental kind of like quantum mechanical issue? Yeah, I think I mean the one of the key um, observations of error correction if you like in a certain sense is that when you make this measurement of your correlations you kind of project the system back and you kind of force the system to choose what type of error it will take. Yeah, I'm making a few assumptions in saying that, yeah, but, but you, uh, quantum mechanics says if you measure something, then you project the system into a particular, usually in undergraduate quantum mechanics, that's a particular state, right? Uh, in, in the case of some quantum computer, then you can make measurements that don't tell you you're in a particular state, but that you might be in a certain region of a number of different states. And that gives you the flexibility to compute within that region in a certain sense, yeah? But so quantum error correction, the way it was motivated was very much theoretical models of errors. Uh, I think where it is today is that we uh, in the, I mean, where we are today is trying to build with qubits at least error correction codes out of seven qubits, nine qubits, something like that. And one of the open questions is exactly what advantage we can take of the fact that the real errors in experiments don't look like the theoretical uh, error you might pluck off the shelf because it's simple to put through your classical computer sort of thing. So are the correlations that we make when we make errors a problem uh, or can they be mitigated by some strategy? Do they help? 
Yeah. Sometimes, you know, in trapped ions, one very nice thing is that certain types of errors that are spatially correlated, uh, you can just make a state that ignores them because uh, in a sense, you spread the information over many systems that have a symmetry that just ignores this type of uh, uh, error. So sometimes you can use uh, correlations, uh, spatial correlations, but sometimes they're problems. And I think that's a little bit what's going on today as people build real experimental systems, then suddenly they have to deal with this problem, uh, which uh, nominally I don't think, uh, as a theorist, it's very hard to deal with the relevant error if you don't know what is constrained by the experiments, right? I mean, you. You can pick an error model, but uh, you you probably can pick either a convenient one or you look at somebody doing an experiment and say, I pick their error model, right? That's how you pick your relevance at some level because the space of types of error model uh, is huge, right? So they could go on forever doing irrelevant error models that never turn up in an experiment. So, yeah. Oh, so you mean the error is kind of the matter of choice depending on the scheme that you designed for the content computer? Yeah, basically, I think the error will inform what type of scheme you want to use. And, and then, you know, you would hope, uh, given the number of uh, physical systems you seem to need to do error correction, which is about a thousand per logical bit of information you might want to store in a quantum computer, you would hope that the types of error we start producing are well behaved and somebody's smart enough to see a shortcut. Yeah, <laughs> because it's pretty horrendous, the scaling at the moment. Yeah, but it's what we seem to have to do. Thank you so much. So I have a question. Yeah. So in your presentation, you said about quantum CCD, and you said that by changing the electric potential, you can change the atoms around. Like, what do you, what 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 are you changing atoms for? Like by changing the electric mm -hmm. potential. Yeah, I mean, so what we were trying to do, so you know, you can uh, you can think that um, I in a computer, right? Think about a classical computer, what it does, right? It has information stored at some locations. It then shuttles it along wires to other locations where it has transistors and things like that. And it does conditional operations. And then it probably restores some of the information, but it takes uh, some of the bits somewhere else and interacts them with other information. So the basic aim of this scheme was to do the same thing in the quantum computing domain, right? So you could have a region where you had several ions that were just sitting there in memory. Uh, but when you needed to use one of those bits, you could bring them to a certain location, pair them up with another ion, which is another one of interest, has information in its own right. And then they have to be in the same region in order to do a gate. So then you shine your lasers on and, and gate happens, right? And so all of those tasks of moving information around, really the wiring up of this quantum computer is about moving these single charges. And for us, that means varying the potentials that trap the charges in order to shuttle them around the place. Did that answer the question? Yes, you did. Good. Thank you. Now, next question, we have uh, one from the audience, Timothy Guo. Um, if you want to uh, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. So um, mm -hmm. one thing is that uh, I think it's based on uh, an earlier question. Um, so I heard that, for example, a superconducting qubit, right, um, is a, is a all fabricated, and because fabrication technologies are quite mature, uh, the scaling up is relatively uh, easier. So your earlier work on the fabricated planar optics uh, ion trap is that is a main motivation also to uh, to help it to to um, scale up more easily. And if so, do you think this is sort of a direction that um, that sort of I trap people should go to for the future in order to scale up or and what are some other uh, options to do scaling up? Yeah, I think, I mean, the, you know, if, if I see one of the, you know, this quantum CCD has sort of always been limited by the fact, and it is in my lab today, right, that you can line up, you have to do, you know, bear in mind that scaling doesn't just involve more, it involves really high accuracy, right? So you have to think that, you know, the, the accuracy with which any of us do stuff is about an order of magnitude of what we think we need to do to build a quantum computer, yeah? So then the question is, how can you uh, both scale and be highly accurate at one time, right? So the, my feeling is that when I've tried to get, for instance, or when I've tried to persuade us in my group uh, to operate more than one zone in parallel with laser beams, then generally that gets really hard if you do everything with free space through a vacuum system because uh, you have to align very accurately laser beams and they all have to be stable. 
in multiple zones, right? So you can see that that's kind of a, a silly challenge in a certain sense. Somebody could do this if they throw a lot of resources at it, but uh, honestly, do you want people to be spending their time doing this uh, or should they be looking at the science somehow, right? So suddenly the integrated optics means that you plug in a fiber and light turns up at that zone. And it really feels like that, that you see the student response to that, right? Um, and so all of a sudden you can have a chip where you, you, you know, we have three zones on the current chip and you can go and use the next zone. You just basically, the light goes into the other fiber. Uh, the ion gets shuttled along by, by changing the potentials uh, and you do stuff in the other zone that day sort of thing, yeah? Uh, so we have a few steps, but for me, this is certainly the way forward. It's just a game changer in terms of um, being able to paralyze things. Yeah, And there are a few other steps we have to make towards paralyzing things. So the other thing that you would see is that, you know, at the moment we have lots of voltage sources. We have sort of 200 lines going into a cryostat controlling lots of electrodes to do the shuttling and things like that. Uh, and some of that probably has to get integrated more into the chip structure. So people start to make DACs and things inside the iron trap chips. Uh, and uh, at the same time, maybe you want to multiplex the imaging. So there are sort of new experiments where people put uh, APDs or um, superconducting detectors in the chips. Yeah. So all of these things are technology things that have to move uh, in order, if you like, that we can scale up while keeping the very high fidelities that are sort of the hallmark of ions. You know, in a certain sense, the largest quantum computers are ion quantum computers just because they can do things more accurately, even if they don't have the qubit count that maybe is claimed for the Google latest chip, right? So they may have 10 qubits, but they work well uh, versus 50, but they actually don't work all that well sort of thing. Yeah, so it's a bit of a trade off and you have to think what exactly you want to do uh, usually with your circuits in order to know what the best device is today. Yeah. No. But I do think the integrated optics should be a game changer. Yeah. Is there any drawback of this? Why are people so? Because I think there are many people are still using free space optics, right? So why are they not? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, but bear in mind. So the one thing about it is that um, the materials aren't there. So you know, the the one of the things you would say if you looked at uh, integrated optics is you'd say fabulous. You can do everything, right? You can turn beams on and off. You can modulate them. You can whatever. But you can do all of that usually at fifteen fifty nanometers. Yeah. And then if you're asked to do it at very specific wavelengths, and particularly as you go down into the ultraviolet, you'll find that there aren't any waveguides you know, at 397 that work really well. So what do you have to do? You have to go and find out what materials work for 397 nanometers. And then you know, we found out things in our experiments, like you know, if we're pulsing light on and off through the waveguides, the way we've done it so far, uh, the, they come out through a little glass uh, opening uh, in the metal structure of the electrodes. And that means that every time we pulse light on and off, there's a bit of charge changes uh, and the ion sees that because it's a charge, right? So it moves a little bit, right? So you see that it's not, it's not that simple. We've managed to get it to work at some level, but you know, our next generation, for instance, will have a conducting layer on the top, which is transparent. And so we think we should conquer that problem. Our next generation will have now Illumina. So we'll be able to do 397 nanometer light. So we're in a first generation of these things. I think that's what it's saying. And, but I think you'll see a fairly fast flip in the field because it's somehow the only way forward in, in this uh, uh, domain, I think. Yeah. Thank you. And maybe we have time for a couple more questions. Um, I'm seeing this one uh, a few times uh, in, in different forms. So maybe I'll combine the two questions. Um, and this is more related to uh, preparation for the field. So um, the, first, the first question is, what should an undergrad who's aspiring to be involved in quantum computing and quantum, quantum information science do to best prepare themselves for the field? And the second closely related question is, what kind of mathematics do you need uh, to get involved in this field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess from, uh, so what should you do? I mean, I think take an interest in um, quantum mechanics and, and those sort of courses, right? I think the, the root of this field is, is good knowledge of quantum mechanics. I think the, the other thing that I say to people who, we have a quantum engineering masters and I, I quite often tell people that, you know, error correction is becoming a bigger part of experimental work. So uh, having a feeling for classical error correction and things like that is probably a useful side lobe. If you wanted to do an engineering course or something like that, there's some intriguing things there. Another thing that's kind of useful is to um, have a good awareness of control, essentially, right? So we, I mean, in the lab, if you're doing lab quantum computing, a lot of it, I mean, there's all sorts of techniques, cryogenics, optics, blah, blah, blah. But uh, one that's kind of key is being able to um, 
yeah, do electronics control. Uh, there's a lot of FPGA programming we find we use embedded control. So a lot of these things are useful sort of side uh, knowledge to have, and they sort of allow you to accelerate well within the field, I think. So uh, all of these aspects, I think, are sort of the things, you know, I mean, obviously going directly at the goal is to go and do quantum computing courses or something like that. But there are many other skills, if you like, that get wrapped into this field. And I always say, you know, one of the things I put in my funding applications is like, you know, I'm gonna, when people come in my group, they will train in, you know, cryogenics, optics, RF electronics, electronics, uh, maybe computer control, high speed, whatever. It's beautiful because somehow, you know, funding people want to train people, right? And I can basically say I train people in everything. Yeah. Uh, so it kind of feels like a nice case, but it, it's quite broad in that sense. Maybe that's going to specialize in the coming years because it becomes too complex, right? To take on all of these things. But uh, nevertheless, I think that's kind of part of the fun of the field, sort of thing. Yeah. You know, one of the things I didn't mention, but one of the things that's really nice about this field is somehow there's a common language extending through atomic physics all the way deep into condensed matter physics. And now actually a little bit beyond because people took these ideas. So we all talk in quantum, but I can talk to the guy doing superconducting circuits and have fun, right? Uh, because we talk the same language and we try and do the same things. And that's kind of nice. It connects different areas of physics. I always enjoyed that. Yeah, and if there's time for uh, one more question, we have one in the audience. Yes, sure. That's all right. Wonderful. Okay, so um, uh, Anna Asofsky, you, if you can uh, unmute and ask your question. Hi. Um. Thank you for your talk. I just I had a quick I guess question about one um something on your slides. So mm -hmm. I didn't quite understand why um how you can show demonstrate entanglement um with your the sine wave being above 50 percent um i was wondering if you might possibly be able to just explain that quickly thank you yeah i can try right so yeah the, essentially the the oh well so how can i do it yeah the, um essentially the deal is that you know the the thing that's the classical correlation would be either i have a probability that both of these spins are up or i have a probability that both of the spins are down right and so somehow that's just classical, right? And people would say boring, right? So the, the key thing is to show this phase in between. And so if I did my interference experiment, but my things were both up and both down, but it's classical, you basically see a completely flat line uh, in that curve. You just would see, you wouldn't see an oscillation at all. You'd see something flat, okay? So the interference experiment would say no interference, no wave effect, yeah? Uh, and then actually, as long as I have the information that I measured uh, the probabilities, any oscillation that I see would tell me I have an entangled state. So my statement was a little bit wrong, yeah? But usually uh, when we're just looking for entanglement, we don't uh, go and do those measurements. We just go and look at this interference. And then somehow the fact that you have uh, a certain amount of wave behavior uh, tells you that these probabilities must be also above a certain value. So all four pieces of information are somehow useful to me. The, the two probabilities plus this wave effect, right? And I'm looking for all four to make a statement, uh, but it turns out that if I just have the wave effect, if it's big enough, then I can already tell you this was an entangled state. These cor basically this wave, this oscillation you're seeing is about um, correlations as a function of some uh, phase that I'm applying to both the systems, yeah? And so they're, it's really the uh, uh, sort of, yeah, I'm looking at correlations as a function of this. And so it's sort of got all the information I need to know about the correlations that might be between these two spins. Yeah, that's, that's the best I can do without pictures and maths, if you like, yeah. But, uh, yeah. I hope that's useful. Yeah. Thank you. Th these, are these are phases you're applying before measuring. Yeah, so basically we come in and we, we rotate the spins and then we measure. Yeah, and we, we can rotate about different axes uh, and this, this measurement just tells me that I varied the axis that I made the measurement. Uh, and so I looked at a, a correlation in a different direction, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Thank you so much. Yep. All right. So it looks like we're nearing the um, time to start uh, wrapping the talk up. So I wanted to thank you again, Professor Holm, for an excellent conversation okay. today. Um, thank yeah. you all in attendance as well. Yeah. For your interest in Chiloquium as well. And hope to see you at uh, next week's talk. Um, if you have any questions, uh, comments, or concerns about Chiloquium, uh, please direct those to myself, Andrew Winicky, in the email I dropped in the chat uh, just now. Um, and thank you all again for coming, and I hope you all have a wonderful week. Thank you, Professor Holm. Thanks. Yeah. Bye.